that. And then you might want to just check and see if we are going live. Yeah. And then you're going to have to close that. Let's see. Testing. Then you testing. might want to just check and see if we are. And you got to you got to kill the sound at least. And then otherwise, you get so much feedback. I'm just going to close it. I would. Okay. Great. Thank you, Pete. He's got the analytics up, and so we'll, we'll know how many people come. How many in. from Poland? <laughs> <laughs> one, one from I'm 
<laughs> That's a mystery of the church. <laughs> Can, we can get started. So welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm glad you figured out it was on Tuesday instead of Wednesday. Um, I hope nobody shows up tomorrow for this, but if they do come, they'll run into F Father Ambrose's party and they'll have a great time anyway. So, so. So tonight, uh, our topic is work and the road to holiness, and it will be presented by Tim Beat. Tim is a member of Ascension Church in Kettering. He is a discalced Carmelite secular. 
Uh, he is currently the president of the St. Mary Development Corporation, which is a faith-based nonprofit that creates affordable housing for older people and connects them to the services they need to live independently. And so I'm very grateful for all that Tim has done. Uh, he had, was very instrumental in getting all three of these talks set up, and I do want to thank him for that. Um, that's been a great help to me. Um, and in addition, I would like to uh, one more time remind you about the website Carmelite Conversations. There are a number of talks and uh, discussions on that website. I think there's something like 250 different talks, discussions that you can listen to uh, and you may enjoy that. And all you got to do is type in on Google Carmelite Conversations and it will pop up for you. And so uh, let's welcome Tim. Let's open in prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, send us your Spirit. Fill our minds and hearts with your will. As we talk about work tonight, show us what a blessing our work is, and help us to find you in it whenever we're there. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So when I'm asked to give a talk, I pray that what I share will be more like Nehemiah chapter 8 than Acts chapter 19. Now Nehemiah 8.12 says, Then all the people went away to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. So sounds like a pretty good talk, right? But then there's Acts 19, which says, the crowd was in confusion, and most of the people did not know why they had even come. <laughs> so you don't have to really complete those evaluations at the end. If you don't have time, you can just either write Nehemiah 8 or Acts 19. <laughs> Jim will know what you mean. So a little bit about myself and my work life. Um, as Jim said, I'm a member of Ascension Church in Kettering. I'm a Discalced Carmelite Secular and President of St. Mary Development Corporation, a nonprofit that is in Dayton, Ohio. Um, my wife, Lynn, is here with me. We have four kids. One is a Dominican sister. We have a son who is a financial analyst in Columbus, a daughter who is studying computer engineering at Ohio State, and our youngest is a, a senior this year at Carroll High School in, um, in the Dayton area. Before I came to St. Mary Development, I was the national marketing manager at um, University of Dayton, and I worked for a family business uh, for a few years, about almost 10 years in Massachusetts before we moved to Ohio. I have a master's in business administration from Indiana University, and I've attended uh, some education at, at Harvard as well. And while I've learned a lot about work, certainly through my formal education, I would say that I've learned the most about work from the church and the saints. And I hope to share some of that with you tonight. I've often struggled with the, to, to navigate the relationship between my faith and work. I struggled with it and tried to balance that when I worked for my family's business in Massachusetts before we came here. And I struggled with it a bit at the University of Dayton. And even in my current job working for a faith-based nonprofit, I struggled to understand the relationship between faith and work sometimes. So what I want to share with you today is some of those experiences that I've had, as well as some of the things that I've read about work and what our faith tells us about our work. So I mentioned that I'm a discalced Carmelite secular. One of my favorite Carmelite saints, or not actually um, not a saint yet, is Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. And he wrote a whole bunch of letters that were compiled into a book called Practicing the Presence of God. Now, Brother Lawrence lived in the 1600s in France. He served in the army and he fought in the Thirty Years' War, and he suffered a, a very bad injury to his leg while he was a soldier. But at age 26, he entered the Carmelite Monastery, the order, and he served and worked as a cook in the kitchen and also as a cobbler in the monastery where he would repair and make the, the uh, sandals that 
the, the friars were. So his vocation in the monastery was made up of prayer and manual labor. And he wrote a lot about how his faith and, and work kind of combined in these letters that became the book Practicing the Presence of God. Now this is how Brother Lawrence was described. And see if this, if this kind of resonates with your own work life. He was a cook who knew stress, the pressure of busy times, the discontent of consumers, ingratitude, monotonous tasks, fatigue, disorder that must be straightened out, and an endless stack of dishes. <laughs> Brother Lawrence wrote, from the moment I entered religious life, I considered God to be the goal and end of my soul's thoughts and affections. And when he worked, he saw his workplace, the kitchen, as holy, as a place to encounter God. He worked both out of obedience to his superiors in the Carmelite order and out of obedience to God. Now, he didn't choose to be a cook. The job was really just given to him. And he didn't even like being a cook. But he still saw being a cook as an avenue to God. The kitchen was his road to holiness. When Brother Lawrence began his work each day, he said, my God, since you are with me, and since I must apply myself to these duties by your order, I beg you to give me the grace to remain with you and keep you company. Even better, my Lord, work with me accept my efforts and take possession of all my affections. During his work day, he spoke to God, offering him his little services and asking him for his graces. And at the end of his work day, Brother Lawrence examined his work. If he found good in it, he thanked God. If he noticed mistakes, he asked for forgiveness, but without getting discouraged. He simply redirected his mind and began again to abide with God as if he had never moved away from him. It wasn't as if his work was separated from his faith at all. Brother Lawrence was always united with God. This is what he called the practice of the presence of God. Brother Lawrence said it was the shortest and easiest way to Christian perfection. He was a simple man, and he said this path was open to everyone, regardless of their vocation. So it's a path that's open to each of us. When he carried out his duties as cook, even in the midst of his work, including the most distracting tasks, his mind was recollected in God. Although his tasks were often great and difficult, often doing by himself what would require two people, he never acted hurriedly. He gave each task the time called for, remaining calm, working neither too fast nor too slow, remaining in the same evenness of spirit and constant peace. Was it an easy process? No, he said it was not. Brother Lawrence wrote, I will admit that during my first 10 years, I suffered a great deal. <laughs> so the road to holiness is not a short road for most of us. But by devoting himself to God through prayer and his work, he eventually got to the point where he wrote, I feel neither concern nor doubt about my state, since I have no other will than the will of God. I keep myself in his presence by simple attentiveness and a general loving awareness of God that I call a quiet and secret conversation of the soul with God that is lasting. Now it's easy for us to think, well, my job's different. Brother Lawrence didn't have it that tough. You know, how stressful could it have been? And maybe that's true, but he might have had more stress than you would think. For example, one of his jobs was buying the wine for the community. And he had a bad leg, but he had to travel on a three-week three trip to purchase the wine. It was a 500-mile round trip. So how did he do his work? Brother Lawrence said that we must act very straightforwardly with God and speak to him freely, asking him for help in events as they happen. So he was asked to go to Burgundy to get this wine. And uh, it was a painful task for him because of his leg. Not only did he lack skill in business, so he wasn't really trained to negotiate and buy the wine for the community. But his leg was crippled, so the only way he could get around on the boat was by dragging himself over the barrels that were all over the boat. Yet he didn't worry about what he did. And I love this part. He told God that it was his problem. <laughs> he told God it was his problem. It was God's work. So he didn't worry because God was going to take charge. I just love that. And he usually discovered that all was accomplished and done well. 
He couldn't explain exactly how his work was done well, since he wasn't the one who accomplished it. And the same was true of the kitchen, to which he had the strongest natural aversion. He hated being in the kitchen, but that's where he spent most of his time. But he got used to doing everything for the love of God, asking him at every opportunity for the grace to do his work. And he was able to carry it out with ease for the 15 years that he worked in the kitchen and he ran the whole kitchen. 15 years, that's a long time to have a job that you don't want. I share that story because maybe we're not thinking about work in quite the right way. We often think about it as the personal satisfaction that we, we get out of it. And Brother Lawrence looked at it work in a very different way. And when Jim asked me if I'd be one of the speakers on this program, I've all, I, I love this topic. I've always been intrigued by it. I've been thinking about the role of work in our lives for more than 35 years. And I remember in 1986, when I was just beginning my career, the US Catholic bishops published a, a pastoral letter called Economic Justice for All. And it was about Catholic social teaching and the US economy. It's a very interesting read, it's something you wouldn't normally think goes together. But it's not about economic theory, it's really about the spiritual and moral implications of our business activity and our work. And I read it with great interest. Then in 1992, the Catholic Catechism was published, and it includes a lot of great information about how our Catholic faith informs our work. I think there are really two important questions to consider to answer, that when we answer them will help us understand Brother Lawrence a little bit better. The first is, what's the purpose of work? And then the second, in a much broader view, is what is our purpose? What is our purpose in being? The pastoral letter Economic Justice for All says, economic life is one of the chief areas where we live out our faith. Love our neighbor confront temptation, fulfill God's creative design, and achieve our holiness. Our economic activity in factory, field, office, or shop feeds our families or feeds our anxieties. It exercises our talents or wastes them. It raises our hopes or crushes them. It brings us into cooperation with others or sets us at odds. The road to holiness for most of us lies in our secular vocations. And if you ask most people what their purpose of their work was, few would tell you that it was their road to holiness. But viewing your work as your road to holiness puts it in a very different light. And it, it kind of begs the question, well, what do you mean a road to holiness? And so I think to understand the meaning of work, we first have to understand the meaning of life, of which work is only one element. And perhaps the most succinct answer to this, for those of you who are older and remember the old Baltimore Catechism, was the very first question in the Baltimore Catechism, and it was, why did God make you? And the answer was simple. God made me to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world, and be happy with him forever in heaven. To know him, to love him, and to serve him. The purpose of life in this world, as well as the next, is union with God. To know him, to love him, and to serve him. So it's only within that greater context that we can even talk about work. Work is not separate from that. And that's really what Brother Lawrence was telling us. So how does our work unite us with God? The Catholic Catechism that came out in 1992, not the Baltimore Catechism, continues this theme of work, being a road to holiness, a way to unite us with God. And it says things such as, human work proceeds directly from persons created in the image of God and called to prolong the work of creation by subduing the earth both with and for one another. So the next time your boss asks you what you're doing, just tell her that you're prolonging the work of creation. <laughs> We sometimes forget that work is something that has always been around since the beginning. In Genesis 2, 8, we read, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and placed there the man whom he had formed. And then just a few verses later, in Genesis 2, 15, we learn the man's role in the garden. The Lord God then took the man and settled him in the garden of Eden to cultivate 
and care for it. To cultivate and care for it. That sounds a lot like work. Work that was side by side with God. God planted, man cultivated and cared for what God planted. God's initiative came first, followed by man's involvement in God's plan. So in this light, the catechism makes a little bit more sense when it says, human work proceeds directly from persons created in the image of God, Adam, and called to prolong the work of creation by subduing the earth both with and for one another. But Adam and Eve, you remember, they didn't remain in the garden for very long. And the nature of their work changed because their union with God was broken. We learn about this in Genesis 3, 17 to 19, where we hear about the change. And this is what God said to Adam. Cursed is the ground because of you, and toil you shall eat its yield all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bear for you, and you shall eat the grass of the field. By the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread, until you return to the ground from which you were taken. Now, like most scripture, there's many ways that you can interpret this. You could view it kind of as a punishment, and God saying, you know, you disobeyed me, and now I will enact justice. But I'd like to suggest in kind of an alternate interpretation. Cursed is the ground because of you. Now, cursed is the opposite of blessed. Blessed means with God. Cursed means without God. So perhaps what God is doing here is simply stating the implication of what Adam had done. God is saying, hey, Adam, we worked together in the garden. You were united to me. I planted and you cultivated. We worked side by side. But you chose to break our union. You have separated yourself from me. Therefore, now you will have to both plant and cultivate. And I'm, I have to imagine that on more than one occasion after the fall, Adam thought, boy, this work was a lot easier when God was here. I mean, that was a, he, there was a lot more that he had to do after that separation. But Adam's call to work, to prolong the work of creation by subduing the earth both with and for one another, for Eve and their children, became a road to holiness, a road back to union with God, a way for us to participate in the redemptive work of Christ. Now, I think in the U.S. we often have kind of a skewed view of, of work. It's a, it's a very uh, kind of um, personal, how I can become fulfilled, and not that those things are, are bad, but we often talk about balance in our lives, this work-life balance. How do I balance the two? But as I've gotten older, and especially as i become immersed in Carmelite -like spirituality, I've come to believe that there is no balance. There's really no such thing as a balance. Because to balance is to have an even distribution of weight or time or energy so that something remains steady. And even distribution means there have to be at least two elements. You can't have balance with just one thing. And it begs the question, what proportion of work, family, leisure, faith do I have in my life to achieve this balance? And the reason I don't believe there's such a thing as balance is because the purpose of life in this world and the next is union with God, not balance with God. There is no way for union if, there, if there's, God is one of many parts. There, if there's union, then there can only be one thing. If our faith is only one part of many, it doesn't work. So to find union with God implies that you are one with God. There's no need for balance when there's only a single object. God's ultimate goal for us is not to find balance, but to be totally united with him. So there's no need for balance. Like Adam and Eve were in the garden when they were with God. Like Adam and Eve were in the garden in their work with God. So in my life, I found that if, I'm, if I want to look at how do I improve my work, the best way is to focus on my union with God. If I want to improve my family life, the best thing is to focus on union with God. To improve any part of my life, the focus has to be with union with God, because otherwise I've separated him from those things. And scripture bears this out. Matthew 22, 34 to 40, the Pharisee asked, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
Your work depends on loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, some people might say, you know, Brother Lawrence, he was in the 1600s. How realistic is that? Jobs are more complicated. We have technology. Things are really fast-paced. And that's true, but I want to tell you the story about the, the co-founders at St. Mary Development Corporation because I think they did what Brother Lawrence taught very well. And then, so it's not a story from the 1600s. This is a story from the 1900s, late 1900s, going into the 2000s. Dick McBride and Sister Rose Wildenhouse, the co-founders of St. Mary Development, they met while serving together on a social justice committee for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Now, neither of them enjoyed committee meetings and things like that. They hated meetings. I'm surprised both of them even agreed to serve on this committee. But they did care about social justice, and they wanted to find like, a real project. And Dick happened to play tennis with one of the Franciscan brothers at St. Leonard Seminary in Centerville. And uh, he, he played every week down there. That St. Leonard's is now the St. Leonard, Leonard Senior Living Community. Well, the Franciscan brother told Dick that uh, they were going to sell the place. They didn't have the vocations. And they were talking to some big corporations about turning it into a corporate training center. And they'd been offered millions of dollars. Well, Dick and Sister Rose, they were having lunch there. And um, they kind of joked. And they said, well, we'll buy the place from you and we'll serve the poor and they emptied out their pockets and they had a dollar and 32 cents and they said that's what we have to offer you well the Franciscans because they served the poor they were kind of intrigued with this concept they said well what what would you do and they said well we'd like to create a place for older people that don't have very large incomes to be able to retire they had some more conversation the Franciscans finally came back and they said we'll we'll sell it to you for a dollar, but you have to do three things and you have to do them within three months. You have to get it rezoned, and we want to see a business plan, and we want you to raise half a million dollars so we know that you're serious about this. And if you can do that within three months, we'll sell it to you, but if you can't, then we'll, we'll just go the other path. Now, Dick and Sister Rose, they had no experience doing this whatsoever. Sister Rose was a teacher and principal, and Dick was an engineer by training. He was kind of in technical sales. So they didn't know about real estate development. They didn't know about senior apartments or anything like that. But they started to share their vision and their plan with churches, and they raised $438,000 within the three months. They were $62,000 short, and many churches and religious orders had given to them. The only one that had not given to them was the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. <laughs> so Sister Rose wrote a letter to the Archbishop, and she said, even the Methodists gave us $50,000. <laughs> and two weeks later, a check for $62,000. <laughs> so they raised, the, they raised their $500,000. So they bought the 240 acres for a dollar, and they began their work. And it, it was successful. They put in apartments. They added a nursing home. And they realized pretty quickly, because it had a health care focus, they weren't equipped to do that. And so they turned it over to another um, uh, Catholic organization that dealt with nursing homes and health care and things like that. And they moved into Dayton and they said, what can we do in, in, um, in Dayton? Well, they found other ways to build affordable housing. And to date, St. Mary Development has built more than 65 apartment communities with more than 4,500 units and a half a billion dollars in real estate development. Just kind of incredible. Well, how did they do this? They kind of did it the way Brother Ray did. Dick on his office door had a big sign that said, God is in charge here. They never saw this as, as their work. And so they, they weren't scared to fail at it because if they failed, it, wasn't, it really wasn't up to them. They just kind of stepped forward in faith. They were really saying to God, hey, this is your problem. You get us into this. You better get us out of it. And they really had true humility. They, they saw their work for what it was, God's work. And I'll tell you a funny story about Dick. They had to do everything. And when they moved to Dayton, the first apartment building they built was Twin Towers Place, which is on Xenia Avenue. And they didn't have a lot of money, so Dick did all the landscaping and the gardening and things there. And one day, he was taking some bankers on a tour of the building, so he's wearing a suit. And one of the residents came up to him and said, it's incredible. You must be the twin of the gardener who works <laughs> <laughs> And when Dick and Rose retired, 
from running the organization for all those years in 2013. They went back to Twin Towers Place, and Sister Rose did activities with the residents, and Dick worked the front desk. There was no difference to them at all if they were running the organization or if they were just working with the residents. It did not matter to them. It wasn't about, and that's one of the reasons they were able to walk away from St. Leonard's. Their ego was not tied up in any of the projects they had because it wasn't their project to begin with. Now there's an old saying, pray as though everything depends on God, but work as though everything depends on you. How many of you have heard that before? Now, it's a pretty common saying. Some people attribute it to St. Augustine, sometimes St. Ignatius or St. Benedict. And on the surface, it kind of makes sense. Trust in God and use your gifts. I kind of get that. But in practice, it's a slippery slope for most people. I know it is for me, and here's why. Because when you work as though everything depends on you, you very quickly, I very quickly begin to believe everything depends on me. And it gets back to this question of balance. You start to think, well, if I'm relying on God and myself, I guess God, you got 50% of the work and I'll take 50% of it. And so you don't have union in your work. You've just divided it up. Or God's the insurance policy. Hey, in case I can't do it, then maybe you can step in. Often the harder we work to solve our own problems and obstacles in our lives, the less we rely on what God wants for us. And the more we struggle and rely on our own effort, the tighter our troubles bind us, especially, I think, in work lives. I have handed out this, if you didn't get it, there's some um, Novena brochures. And uh, it's, it's a brochure by Servant of God, Father Don Rotolo, who lived from 1882 to 1970. And for a time, he was the spiritual director of Padre Pio. Father Don received from Jesus the words of the Surrender Novena, which describes abandonment to God through the perspective of Jesus, as if Jesus, it's written as if Jesus is speaking directly to you. And the refrain of the Novena is, O oh Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. Take care of everything sounds a lot like Brother Lawrence telling God that it was his problem, doesn't it? So let me read you a few excerpts from the Surrender Novena. And as I read them, I want you to consider how they might apply to your work, whatever that work is. This is Jesus speaking to you. In pain you pray for me to act, but that I act in the way you want. You did not turn to me. Instead, you want me to adapt to your ideas. You are not sick people who ask the doctor to cure you, but rather sick people who tell the doctor how to do it. So do not act this way, but pray as I taught you in the Our Father. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is, in our need, decide as you see fit for our temporal and eternal life. If you say to me truly, thy will be done, which is the same as saying, you take care of it, I will intervene with all my omnipotence, and I will resolve the most difficult situations. Are we willing in our work to say to God, you take care of everything in the way Brother Lawrence did? Another section of the Novena says, what troubles you and hurts you immensely are your reason, your thoughts and worries, and your desire at all costs to deal with what afflicts you. You are sleepless. You want to judge everything, direct everything, and see to everything, and you surrender to human strength, or worse, to men themselves, trusting in their intervention. This is what hinders my words and my views. Oh, how much I wish from you this surrender to help you, and how I suffer when I see you so agitated. Now, I know in my job, I like to feel that I'm in control, or at least that things are under control. People don't want to go anywhere and feel like your life's spinning out of control. But this next part of the novena is what really blows my mind. Satan tries to do this, to agitate you and to remove you from my protection and to throw you into the jaws of human initiative. So trust only in me, rest in me, surrender to me in everything. What does it mean to be thrown into the jaws of human initiative? 
I don't believe that it's saying that we shouldn't use our skills and talents. Of course, when God gave them to us, we have to use our skills and talents. But in your work, how many problems do you see that were created through human initiative? Aren't many of the greatest problems in our businesses, schools, family, and culture created by human initiative? What would it look like to surrender to God in our work? We are not sick people who ask the doctor to cure us, but rather sick people who tell the doctor how to cure us. Yet we have no idea how to cure ourselves. Union with God means saying, oh Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. Take care of everything. Which things? Everything. Everything. This is what Brother Lawrence did. Other Carmelite saints also encouraged the surrender. Saint Teresa of Lisieux said, he finds few hearts who surrender to him without reservation, who understand the real tenderness of his infinite love. If you want to feel the real tenderness of his infinite love, surrender to him. Surrender your work to him. Saint Teresa of Avila said, forget yourselves and surrender to God Come what may. Come what may. Are you crazy? Isn't that the main reason we don't surrender to God in our lives? And, you know, in any part of our life, let's be honest, we are scared to death to surrender to God. Come what may is not reassuring. It makes us want to even more look at that human initiative. How am I going to get myself out of this? Our goal is union with God, but we are scared to death of union with God because we will no longer be in control, or at least we won't feel that we've been in control. We have never been in control. I even think it's like a, a clock that's broken. It's right twice a day. Twice a day, it feels like it's working. And I think that's like with our lives. There are certain points where the pendulum is swinging. We think everything's okay, and now it's it's not, and it's back. And we long for that spot right in the middle. But God is truly in control. We are not in control. We're unwilling to say, as Brother Lawrence did, God, my work is your problem, to say, God, you take care of everything. So how do we find union with God and begin to act as Brother Lawrence described? How do we feed our families instead of our anxieties? How do we best exercise our talents instead of wasting them? How do we raise hope instead of crushing it? How do we surrender to God? How do we truly, deeply ask him to take care of everything? I'd like to offer four ways that have helped me. The first is silence. We are bombarded every day by noise. The road to holiness and surrender is paved with silence. Silence allows us to hear God. In his book, The Power of Silence Against the Dictatorship of Noise, Cardinal Robert Seurat writes, our world no longer hears God because it is constantly speaking at a devastating speed and volume in order to say nothing. Modern civilization does not know how to be quiet. It holds forth in an unending monologue from morning to evening, from evening to morning. Silence no longer has any place at all. The noise tries to prevent God himself from speaking. In this hell of noise, man disintegrates and is lost. He is broken up into countless worries, fantasies, and fears. How can you be open to the mystery of God, to spiritual values, and to our human greatness in continual turmoil? Contemplative silence is a fragile little flame in the middle of a raging ocean. Take 10 minutes a day and simply sit in silence with God. Don't speak, just allow yourself to simply be in God's presence. For those of you who have tried it, it's more difficult than it seems. Thoughts and tasks will fill your mind. And when they do, simply return to God. We were talking before about a lot of times people feel like, I'm so distracted, how can this prayer be useful? If you're distracted every 10 seconds for 30 minutes, think of all the times that you have willed to return yourself to God. That's the prayer. You're willing yourself back to God, and the distractions allow you to do that. Over time, 
God will talk to you when you get to know him and have that union in the silence. The second way is detachment. Certainly detachment from material things, but also from non-material things. Think about what we experience in work. Power, pride, position, success in your work. And I would add detachment from prayer. And I don't mean that we shouldn't pray, but rather when we pray, we should detach ourselves from what we want God to give us. He knows what we need much better than we do. So even detach yourself from the things that you, you want from God. St. Teresa of Avila wrote, it is an important matter for beginners in prayer to start off by becoming detached from every kind of satisfaction and to enter the path solely with the determination to help Christ carry the cross like good cavaliers who desire to serve their king at no salary since their salary is certain we should fix our eyes on the true and everlasting kingdom which we are trying to gain. If there's one thing I've learned about myself is I do not know what's best for me. If God gave me everything that I prayed for, it would not be in my best interest. I'm sure some of you have seen that. Sometimes it's only in hindsight that you, that you see that. Being open to what God has for us and the blessings he has for us is much more important. Detachment in prayer means we seek only what God wants. The third way is the sacraments. What a blessing we have in the sacraments, and especially in the sacraments of the Eucharist and confession. What a loving God who gave us such tangible ways to encounter him, to be fed by him, to be forgiven by him. Receiving the Eucharist and going to confession, it moves us along that road to holiness. They provide this great intimacy and union with God. And the Eucharist and confession may be the most important part of your work life. We don't often associate it with, with work, but as we're trying to solve problems and be united with God, those are very important. The fourth way is to pray the surrender novena that I, I handed out. And I don't mean just saying it once, but over and over. It's very short. Pray it so often that you find yourself saying over and over throughout your day, Oh, Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. It may seem strange to suggest that silence, detachment, the sacraments, and surrender are the keys to success in work. None of these things were mentioned when I went to business school. <laughs> and they don't guarantee that you're going to find success in your work as the world defines success. But we were not born for worldly success. We were born for union with God. Union in our life on earth and continuing our eternal life in heaven. Thank you for allowing me to share today. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Just a uh, comment, Tim. Um, listening to all you're saying, you know, is uh, wonderful for us because you know we've been experiencing this for many years. And I think that, that we have to realize that all these things are because of our pride. You know, lack of self-control, wanting success, and all that is is because uh, you know, Satan attacked us in our pride. And that's why he fell, you know, from the heavens because of his pride. And I think that, you know, I find for myself personally, the only way I can accomplish this is to be thinking about the Lord and asking for himself or praying or praising him or asking for forgiveness, whatever, constantly during the day. But if you take your mind off of what you just said, and you go back to the secular mindset that we've all grown and brought up with. And uh, so I, I think if you realize that, uh, you know, the, the, this all ties into it with the uh, idea that uh, as we share in God's glory, we're going to share in his suffering. And these little crosses that we have are for our salvation. So we have, that, if we put all this together, you know, that, that it really you know, goes along with the message you're telling us. Yeah. And so I appreciate it. And if you want to learn more about suffering, then if you weren't here for the first talk, that was all about suffering, right? <laughs> and that's on YouTube, too. <laughs> that's a good point, Ernst. You know, if you think about 
we were not made for success on earth, and that's not our goal. Um, to recognize people who aren't succeeding in the way that secularism tells us, in the house and you know, cars and all this kind of stuff, to be able to see them as being successful. Because they may have a union with God that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. And it's, but it's, um, you know, it's hard sometimes to uh, find a way to communicate that you, that you appreciate them for what they are and where they are, because we don't, we don't know where they are in their union with God. And we, we, so often we compare ourselves yeah. to people maybe in similar jobs. But God has called us each to things that are, are very intimate and, and personal. So if you're an accountant and there's 20 accountants in your department and you're next to them, your vocation is not the same as those others. You have different family life. You have, there's all kinds of different things. You still have to discern. It's easy to look and say, well, I need to do what so-and-so is doing. Well, maybe they're not calling you to that. And I think oh, even within the church, a lot of the arguments that you hear are when one person feels called to something and they're angry that not everybody feels the same calling. Why isn't everybody else on this committee with me? Well, no, you, you were called to a special role and each of us were. And there's a lot of intimacy in that. Where is, what adventure is God going to bring you on with the skills that you have and that you have been given? Um, it might not be the traditional corporate ladder, regardless of what you you are. If you become an you know an engineer or who knows where God is going to lead you. But in that prayer, every day, and in that silence, and in that detachment that you find God, that's God how God will lead you. Sister Rose was an incredible example because she told me when she was a novice sister, she prayed that they were assigned the same pew. She was in Pew 67. I have a picture of it in my office. She spent four hours a day in that pew between mass and adoration. And that prayer habit and that peace allowed her to discern for her entire life. It stayed with her. It was that, that formation allowed her to do things and do it with great abandon. For the sisters, she, she had never been out of Dayton before. She came to dinner one night, and there was a little card in front of all the sisters. And she opened it up, and it said, you're going to be a teacher in Phoenix. Well, she'd never been to Phoenix. <laughs> it was a, her life was a great adventure. It was exciting. And, and that can be true for the lady, too. Your career can be a great adventure. Where is God going to bring you? I can tell you, when I was 10 years old, I did not dream about being an administrator of a nonprofit. I would have never in a hundred years picked this job. I wouldn't even tell you I find great joy in the job, but do I like what I'm doing? No, I wouldn't have picked it. Matter of fact, I remember we were in a prayer group when just after we got married, and I remember the leader of the prayer group talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and I remember telling me she thought I had the gift of administration. And I was like, that was like the worst gift ever. The administration. Like somebody can heal, somebody speaks in tongues, and I can sign and wait. What is that about? That's not. But in, one of the things that I've learned is why I never would have picked the job. There's no job I would have picked for myself that I might have found pleasure in that would have brought me the deep joy of feeling what God was able to do through me. So powerful, much more satisfaction. But it's not something you get through career counseling. It's not as I wouldn't have picked it on my own. He kind of had to shove me to, to get here. How do you think we uh, can live out our faith well when there's like a crisis or a disaster at work? Like, I can kind of get to see in the day to day, but when there's like something really disruptive that happens. You, you mean like disruptive to the business or? To the business, yeah. Or I worked for a nonprofit at one point and we had, not among our staff members, it was a college ministry, we had a uh, scandal among some of our students. So I think a big part of it is the peace that you get in prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, Lynn and I are going through the Bible in a year. Read the Old Testament. There is nothing that's going on today that's any more scandalous than that. I mean, read Genesis. So the, the, a, a big part of it is when people say, 
well, why aren't you more upset about this? Well, God's in charge of it. We'll, we'll, we will get through it. And I, I find being able to bring that peace into a workplace, even when you, there's a lot of workplaces you might think, well, I can't bring my faith into the workplace. Well, as a faith-based nonprofit, we actually can't either because we build apartment buildings and because of fair housing laws, we can't bring religion into it, into the buildings. And I'll never forget, I was talking with a resident at one point, and I told her this. She was a, a wife of a pastor. She was Baptist. She ran all these Bible studies, and I said to her, I said, Jay, you know, we can't say that we're faith-based. We can just say this is an apartment building. She said, oh, Kim, it doesn't matter. Whenever residents come in and I talk to them about how they came here, they always tell me how the Spirit led them here. The fact that we can't say anything doesn't get in God's way. It just makes it more miraculous. So I think the, in, in that those crises, the peace is the big thing. It's easy to have anxiety. Everybody has anxiety and get upset by it. But we're, we're in this for the long term. We're eternal beings. Why would we be worried about that? It's a fleeting moment. I often use the, the, um, the analogy that when you have young kids and you know, uh, infants and you have to bring them to get inoculated for different things and you know they're going to be scared and they cry. But as a parent, you know, this is it. This is nothing. You know, you know they're gonna, they'll get a lollipop. They'll be okay with it. You put a Band-Aid on. But you know the greater good. Our whole lives are like that. God looks at us and says, this suffering is not there. You're going to be with me for eternity. What if, this, is, this is just a, a blip. To, why wouldn't we give up our lives and, and do these other things? To us, it, like that, that infant, it seems horrific. My whole life is the needle going into my arm. Everything is bad at work. But it's not. It's, it's fleeting. It's all fleeting. And so, I think sometimes we think, our eternity starts in heaven. Our eternity started when we were conceived. We're, we're in our eternity right now. That's an amazing thing. We're eternal beings right now. And this is just a, the, the shortest part of our eternity that we're living through. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, please put the forms, the evaluations in the box back there. And I wish you all the, uh, a happy fourth and a, a good summer. Thank you. Thank you.